Hi, this is Carlisle's Chesapeake, and today we have a special guest, Chip Ackridge, who's going to talk to us about his work on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Uh, Chip is, uh, he and his wife Sally live here in Talbot County um, and does a commute to D.C. on a regular basis, um, but he's been here for 35 years. So we're going to talk about the Chesapeake Bay, uh, Washington, D.C., and thank you for having, uh, for being here, Chip. Carl, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, tell us about your work in Washington, D.C., particularly about your interest in the National Mall. Well, um, about 15 years ago, actually, a young lady came to my office and said, Mr. Ackridge, do you know that the mall is in terrible, terrible shape? And I said, you know, no, I don't. And that's surprising because I'm a runner and I run on the mall quite frequently. Um, and I'm in the real estate business, so you'd think that it, with real estate I would be noticing it was not in such good shape. But the next time I go down there, I'll put on my, uh, my uh, property management hat and I'll take a look. And she was right. It, it's a disgrace. And this, this was in the 70s? This is early, yes. No, not in the 70s. No. This, this was in the uh, uh, 2000s. Oh, I'm sorry. The 70s is when uh, I, Lady, the, um, Lady Bird Johnson le left. In that, in, at that point, when she left, uh, and when I came to town, the, the mall was in pristine shape. It was in absolutely first class shape. Uh, but she left in, in, uh, shortly before 72. And for 40 years, the, the federal government has not uh, funded. Uh, the deferred maintenance in not only the, on the mall but in the park system nationwide to the tune of there's now 13 billion dollars worth of work needed to be done just to repair and fix things that are broken or worn out uh, in the mall system uh, countrywide. The mall's share of that is about a billion dollars we need to spend on that a space. A billion dollars. A billion dollars, yes. And where would those when you get those monies, because I know you will, Chip. <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> when you get those monies, um, where will you be spending those monies? There are really uh, two different uh, needs. One, one is the uh, need for repairing things that are just worn out, things like the, the water system, the, some of the electrical system, some of the uh, paths and, and walkways or don't meet ADA, American Disabilities Act uh, provisions, uh, that all need to be fixed. Uh, and it's, it's expensive. Uh, it's a lot more expensive than I ever would have thought, but I've come to find out it's, it's expensive. Then there are other uh, items that we're, we have to do which will help handle the 36 million visits that we had last year. We mm. expect that to grow to 40 million visits over the next four or five years. And it will include things like creating new new places to, to uh, entertain people, where people can come and sit down and have, have a um, uh, picnic lunch or come and watch a uh, performance of some type of uh, music venue. Um, or they can have a quiet place where they can come and, again, uh, uh, in Constitution Gardens, for instance, they can sit down and they can have a nice conversation. It's a quiet place in, t in town, and we'll have a, a full uh, sit down restaurant there as well, along with a retail shop and some bathroom facilities. So uh, it, there are really two different uh, types of improvements uh, needed to, one, fix what's broken, and number two, to take care of our visitors. And to enhance what's there because the beauty is just unsurpassed. Correct. It is. Uh, Washington, D.C., um, designed by L'Enfant, yes. um, just is just a pristine city to come visit and everything, oh, just about everything is free, which you, know, you just don't go to another city and get that. Right, it's true. That's, that's one of our, the problems with the mall is that many of the other parks do charge admission um, and they help use, use that money to help uh, meet some of their maintenance uh, requirements. Uh, we can't, we can't and don't intend to do that, so we have to depend on federal funding, which has really not been there, or private donations. And that's why we, we put formed the Trust of the National Mall. It's, it, it was uh, modeled entirely after the Central Park Conservancy in New York. Uh, when I realized uh, what bad shape it was in, it didn't hit me at first to do anything about it, but I finally realized, you know, when I, when I came to town in 72, it was in pristine shape. And if I could do anything to keep from passing this along to our children, I was going to do it. And so it took a couple of months, but all of a sudden I had a brainstorm. I said, you know, there's a Central Park Conservancy. I'm going to see Bill Beidecke, who formed the Central Park Conservancy, and talk to him about it and see if I can copy what he did um, because it's a public-private partnership. It's with the st city of New York, not, not the federal government, but still it's a, a public-private partnership. And Bill was very accommodating, very welcoming, and said, sure, just copy everything we did. So uh, that's what we've done. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Okay, so tell us some of the parts. Um, so those of us who know DC and those who don't can kind of understand, right, give a frame of reference. You have um, the reflecting pool. The, 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 the park consists of about 770 acres, and it goes from the foot of Capitol Hill, 3rd Street, uh, all the way west to the Potomac River, which the uh, Lincoln Memorial sits right on the Potomac River. It goes uh, north to the south side of Constitution Avenue, and it goes south down to include the Jefferson Memorial, which is on the south side of the uh, uh, ref uh, reflecting pool, um, the Tidal Basin, excuse me. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's the general area, and it runs the green strip uh, between the Smithsonian Museums, which are between 3rd and 5th, 14th Street. And I know they've been all dug up. Uh, are, are you laying down We've, waterways? We, 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 water did, we did. We, we, we did tear them up. We did put in an irrigation system. But the reason we tore them up is, is that the, the soil, soil that was there was not really soil. It was really um, fill that was pumped out of the bottom of the Potomac. This, the, this whole area was, was swamped uh, yeah. back in the early days. And it's, it's fill, and it um, became ve it's become very compacted and would not support vegetation. Essentially, some weeds would grow there, but that's about it. So we had to t pull the dirt out, uh, amend it substantially, uh, put in drainage underneath, irrigation system, put the soil back, uh, put uh, the put, uh, pr prescription turf, which is, was has been developed primarily for um, athletic fields, but it's a very resilient, uh, tough um, turf for this particular climate. The Mid Atlantic is not the friendliest place for turf in, su in the summertime. <laughs> Um, uh, many diseases exist uh, for turf. But anyway, uh, we put that turf down the first, we put it down four years ago, uh, and it's, uh, it's doing great. I mean, it's just terrific. And um, the Sullivan Theater that surrounds the Washington Monument, tell us about that. Well, the, it, it's one of those uh, spot just south of the monument itself, outside the security perimeter, which has been installed uh, in, in recent years. Uh, it was built in the 50s, and it, it's, it's wooden, and it has, as you would expect, 50s technology in it, which is none. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's, we weren't techno whizzes then, were no, we? No, we were not then. No. Um, and as a result, it's not, a, it's not a very functional venue for any performance of any kind. Uh, we, we conducted a, a national design competition for both um, uh, uh, Sylvan Theater at the Washington Monument and Constitution Gardens. Um, and came up with uh, two terrific designs to improve those uh, spaces, to improve the visitor experience. And that's the primary reason for that. So the Sylvan Theater will be a real uh, theater with a, a theater in the round uh, using the Washington Monument base. Uh, the, the grassy area there, a seating area, will be able to hold as many as 10,000 people. Oh my gosh. There for, uh, How for, wonderful. For, 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 for performances. And uh, we'll have a, a sit down restaurant, a retail space and more bathrooms. Okay, so then you have the, I, I had a chance to go um, in October to the National African American Museum, which sits right across from that Washington Monument, and wow, what a gem. Yeah, it is. It's beautiful. Um, and then the Constitution Gardens, those gardens are 38 acres, but yet I wasn't familiar with that territory, so could you tell us about that, please? Well, Constitution Gardens was uh, actually uh, designed by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill back in the uh, early 70s. It was completed in 1976 for the bicentennial uh, celebration. Um, and unfortunately, back in the early 70s, the word sustainable and la landscape weren't used together in the English language. And so it wasn't sustainable, and it hasn't been sustainable, and it has continually gone downhill. We have 30-year-old trees that are about this big around because of the soil that they're pl planted in is not sustainable, uh, and they, they, they just can't survive. So uh, we're looking to, to uh, correct all that, make it w one of the gold standards in this country of urban green spaces, as, nice. well, as well as providing this or amenities like um, another sit-down restaurant, bathrooms. Uh, we're going to make the, the pond that's there now uh, ecologically functional so that fish can live in it. They, all die about the first of May every year because <laughs> it's too hot uh, and the oxygen runs out. But um, 
we'll there'll be fishing uh, in the summertime, and we'll have uh, an ice rink in it in the wintertime. So, oh, nice. so to give uh, to activate the space, and that's why you don't kn know it's there. You, you don't go there. Nobody goes there. You can go down down there any time of the of the day or afternoon, and, and uh, there's virtually nobody in the space because there's really nothing to see or do. Well, everybody does know about the cherry blossoms. Everybody does. Yes. And tell us about them, please. Well, they they are like a lot of things. They they are living. Things they need maintenance. Um, they're hundred over hundred years old, aren't they? Over hundred. Well, they just just turned hundred years old, okay. and, and many of them have died, and uh, many have been replaced, and many will continue to die, uh, and need to be replaced. And so we're uh, there is an endowment, but it's it's less than a million dollars. We're trying to increase that endowment by a significant amount so that we can annually uh, provide maintenance to those trees to keep them alive longer. Um, and we're looking at redesigning the the walkway around the Tidal Basin so that we can handle the, the number of visitors that come for the cherry blossoms every year uh, and not walk I mean, amongst the trees and, and compact the soil, which is adding to the, the demise of the trees. Now, the lock keeper house that was just moved, yes. um, that lock keeper house is the oldest structure on the mall? It is, and it was boarded up when I came to Washington in 1972, um, and it we've unboarded it and we, we moved it uh, off the the corner of Constitution um, and 18th, which was a, it was in a dangerous location. Actually, it was, it was too close to Constitution Avenue and 18th Street too. Uh, but we moved it to the southwest, uh, back off the corner, and we, we will make an educational uh, facility out of that, where people can learn about really the, the, the birth and growth of commerce in Washington, because uh, the Constitution Avenue and 18th Street were both canals oh, back cool. in the early day, and that's how commerce, how, how merchandise either came into or went out of Washington. We didn't have the road system in the, in the country, you know, big trucks and that kind of thing. Uh, so it was a very key element to the uh, economic uh, engine of Washington, D.C. And um, we will be able to tell that story inside uh, the house. So you're going to do some digital uh, education in that lock keepers? Absolutely, yeah, yes. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. D.C. is on the Potomac, and the Potomac then flows into the Chesapeake Bay, and then now we're down here on the shore, on the eastern shore, and we've got this beautiful Chesapeake Bay that um, most everybody here knows about, but of course we want more people to know about it outside of this area as well. Mm -hmm. um, your love and Sally's love brought you and your family here to raise your children, and um, you also take care of land uh, because of your interest in real estate, mm -hmm. you take care of land here on the on um, Talbot County. So, could you tell us about that, please? Sure. Um, my love of the Chesapeake Bay goes back when we first moved to the area. It's just a, a fabulous resource. Uh, I served on the the uh, Ch Chesapeake Bay Foundation board for six years, um, and back in those days, the, the Scores were getting worse every year, and that was the not scores a, being uh, the quality of the water. The quality of the water. Um, but recently, they've been improving, and that's a, a very good sign. And hopefully, that we will not take um, uh, governmental action that reduces that uh, that, that support um, to continue that upward uh, climb. Uh, and we have bought a, n a number of farms that uh, front on a tributary of the, the Chesapeake Bay, and we've converted most of the, that land to. Uh, uh, wildlife habitat and, and water quality uh, uh, improvement as opposed to commercial ag, which is what most of the land was uh, used for prior to us, us buying it. And uh, there's been a very um, uh, satisfying hobby, I guess you want to look at it that way. It's uh, a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's, it was, it's been a lot of effort. And, uh, but we made substantial progress. I wish that I'd known what kind of impact we were going to have when we started, because if I had it, we would have done a good baseline study to find out what the quality of the water was in our creek before we started and what it is now. But we have just recently completed a, uh, a study with uh, Horn Point Lab, which is the uh, University, University of Maryland, Maryland. Educational Center. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, all work together to uh, uh, measure uh, what we've been able to accomplish in terms of the water of you know, Tripps Creek, which is where our, our farm is located. And it's been substantial uh, over that many uh, years. We, we can. You can see the bottom of the, of the creek on our dock now, which Isn't we, that had, beautiful? we haven't been able to see that for you know, 25 or so years. Um, Is that because of oysters? Uh, well, we were able to, to grow oysters without uh, disease, and they grow fairly rapidly where we are. It's because of the quality of the water. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. 
But so, then they all, the oysters also help the quality of the water. Absolutely. They yeah. do. It's, it's like a symbiotic relationship right. here. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. I mean, when uh, John Smith came uh, to America, you know, oysters were about this big. Uh, I've seen some petrified shells. That, you know, about wow. That and they uh, were able to, to uh, uh, filter the water about every two days, all the water in the Chesapeake Bay. Yes. Uh, we fished that out, so that doesn't happen anymore. But we we are putting lots of oysters back in, and that's going to be helpful uh, to all of our efforts. And um, we're going to be cooking a duck <laughs> the next part of this um, show. So if you would just tell us about uh, your interest in um, duck and goose hunting. Well, um, actually, the goose hunting was one of the things that led us to to the shore. Uh, I did some of that back in the uh, early '70s, and. Um, got to know the area somewhat and was very impressed with the, the water. Sally and I grew up in uh, East Tennessee uh, and we love the mountains, they're, they're, they're wonderful, but um, we've come to love the water uh, probably even more and that's uh, one of the major things that, that moved us to the eastern shore. That and we moved to Easton particularly because of the country school and the education that they were providing back in 72, 73, 74, uh, back in there. It was very exceptional c compared to the public system and uh, without that we would not have been able to move here. So um, you're, we're, we're going to be cooking duck mm -hmm. and I know you and Sally are very good um, uh, at <laughs> eaters, <laughs> eaters. <laughs> uh, and your support of the Pickering Creek um, Audubon Center is also very commendable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good um, operation. They do a great job with the children. Uh, they have a lot of children through there every year. Uh, and it's um, uh, it's good that people don't you know, you're not born knowing about the, the environment um, and it you need somebody to, you te have to teach learn. somebody has to teach you yeah right? well mm -hmm. thank you so much Chip for you're all welcome. you do thank you thank you very much Chip, could welcome. you tell us uh, the website for the National Mall sure it's www.nationalmall.org you can learn everything you need to know about the mall right there thank you and we'll be right back stay with us we're back. In the second half of our show, we have Scott Kemp with us today, who is the sous—I'm sorry—who is the chef de cuisine. You were the sous chef for two years, and now you're the chef de cuisine at Banning's Restaurant here in Easton. I'm the, I'm the chef de cuisine here at Banning's Restaurant. I'm going today. I'm going to walk you through uh, how to prepare a crispy skin duck with a pear glaze. It's uh, quite delicious. It's a staple menu on our item. Um, so, first you have um, a duck that hasn't been cooked yet. You're going to show us that. Yes, I'm going to start from raw and show you how to sear the skin and make the sauce and finish on uh, wild rice. Because, Scott, you are from the Eastern Shore and so you're familiar with handling ducks, is that correct? Well, uh, mostly through the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was never much of a hunter on ducks, but uh, I have cooked quite a few. Well, good. I'm glad that you're here with us today to do that. So, let's let's look at a duck then. Okay, let's take a look. All right. Scott, you're going to um, cut the duck up for us. I'm going to show you to clean this whole duck. It's a uh, farm-raised maple leaf duck. Um, I'm going to uh, just find the breastbone right here. And I'm going to cut along the right hand side and finding the breastbone down. Now you're wearing gloves because only because it's a it's a poultry product and uh, I'd rather not get it on my hands when we go to uh, cook it, you know, for cross contamination reasons. I'm just going to find the wishbone right here as you can see. I'm going to follow it down right to the wing. There's a rib cage here. I don't know if you're catching that on the camera. I'm just going to follow the rib cage down like this here. Right on down. There's a little bone right here on the bottom. I'm going to cut right to the backbone. Pop this leg loose. It seems like it's cooperating with you. Oh, yes. <laughs> and right along the backbone here, right back up to the wing. Cut right through. And you've got a great knife. And uh, it's nice to have a nice sharp bone in there. And there is uh, one half of the duck. And, and now how just much would this serve? On. Would this be a serving? This would be good for one people unless you're not very hungry. It, you could share and it would be enough. 
just a paste the with person. the vegetables and potatoes and rice it would be enough yeah. yeah and then of course you would just continue on with the other side okay that's good yeah. all right so we're going to go now to the kitchen yeah. part <laughs> now to sear the duck we'll take this this uh, 12 inch pan and get it pretty nice and hot maybe not smoking hot but it's pretty hot and uh We'll just put the duck skin side down. Woo! And so that, you didn't even put any grease in there because the duck has so much fat in it. The, the duck will, uh, once it starts to cook, it'll render enough fat that it, it won't stick at all. Wow. And uh, it takes about five or six minutes on, on this side. And then when we turn it, uh, we'll add some vegetables and some duck stock and uh, pop it in the oven. So when you're, you're searing it now, is that correct? That's correct. We're searing the skin nice and crispy. On both sides? Uh, we'll only sear the skin and then uh, while it's here, we will transfer some of that fat onto the meat side and then flip it and it'll be uh, the oven's job from then on. Okay. And you're going to use a combination, a mirepoix is it called? Um, a mirepoix and some, a little bit of herbs. And the mirepoix is a combination of vegetables and herbs? Mirepoix is uh, generally carrot, celery, and onion. And then you have some thyme and rosemary. Thyme and rosemary. Nice. And then you're going to make a pear sauce. A pear sauce. Nice. Yeah. And pear and, and just that combination of that fall vegetable uh, with a pear or maybe an apple. An apple. An apple will work just as well as sauce. Yeah. Okay. We'll give it just a little bit of salt and pepper. Just take a little peek. And you really want that skin to, to be down to the pan. And how do you know when the meat is done? The meat will be done at when it reaches 155. Or depending, that's for about medium rare or medium. And then, uh, of course, uh, warmer or hotter if you want it more well done. Sir, are you going to put a thermometer in it? So I, I will check it with a probe thermometer. Wow. And so when when um, the waitress asks the customer, well, how do you like your duck served? Or do you just go ahead and serve your duck at a certain it, level? It will be served uh, medium rare to medium. Okay. Yeah. Unless they Unless want it otherwise. Right. That's correct. But so you have basically have to know what you're doing then. As a, as a, as a person coming in for the restaurant, like I want my duck served a certain way. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And maybe from trial and error, perhaps the customer knows that they like it a little more. Uh -huh. But you recommend that it be on the rare side? Or medium rare, it be perfect. Yeah, because then the meat's more tender? Uh, no, it's just, uh, yeah, I would say it's it's not as tough, you know. I see. It, it, the duck tends that it, it really doesn't get to stay tough, no. like a steak. Smells really good. Uh, Dining has a Dining has a great um, menu. Uh, their restaurant has so many nice things on the menu that complement the seasons. And this is the end of the fall um, with the waterfowl festival, and so it's it's a pleasure to be here talking yeah, about ducks. <laughs> right. uh, we sold quite a few ducks during the water festival. Yeah. Because it's not something that you normally would be able to get at another restaurant. Maybe not the whole duck. Uh, other places do, uh, uh, I've, I've seen that other places uh, do offer a, a duck breast or an appetizer or an entree of that sort. This is what I like to do. I like to just take take the fat to one side and just get it on the inside where that skin didn't quite touch down. This is something you really have to tend to. It's not like you can walk away and say, cook, cook on your own here. Nope. And I think we're just about right there. So, uh, just turn this down a little.
So about how long is it going to take up the dust to cook? Now, uh, once, you, once you have it to this stage here, I'm going to take and take all, all except one tablespoon of the fat out. And I'm just going to guesstimate. It's not really important. I'm going to put it on about medium heat. Well, once we put it in the oven, it'll take uh, about 35 minutes in a 400 degree oven. And I'm just going to add the vegetables. Onions, carrots, some celery, rosemary, thyme, and potatoes. That's a nice meal. Mm. Really nice. Now, what is this you're putting in? This here is duck stock where I used the bones from another duck oh. and uh, rendered, uh, roasted it, and then uh, put it in water to get, get a nice stock. I'm going to add about a half of a cup. Oh, that's beautiful. So you have to be patient if you're out there in, in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. This isn't something you can just that's like it. snap and say, hey, mm -hmm. this is done. <laughs> and this is just for one person, right? This is one for one order, yeah. 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 Beautiful. And once we have it here, we'll pop it right down to this oven. And after our 35 minutes, we'll take a look at our top. Oh, how beautiful. And we have it right here. The vegetables are nice and tender. The duck is good. We'll just bring it right over here. And we have our rice ready. I've been standing here the whole time, just watching and smelling. So beautiful. That's beautiful. No, we got we got to put our pear on. Put our sauce on. <laughs> For cherries with the uh, base sauce of the sugar and vinegar and duck stock or chicken stock, you can add uh, any fruit you like, pretty much. It makes a uh, fruit glaze just like this. Scott, you are awesome. Thank, oh, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks, thank you so much for spending the time with us and telling us how to make this beautiful dish. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not a problem. Very fun. Come to Bannings, everybody. You have a good, right. good meal. Thank you. Right. You're welcome.